Hello everyone, today we talk about Marcus Porcius Cato Cancer, also known as Cato the Elder, uh, the, or the Wise. There are lots of cognomina that were attributed to him also by later same Roman um, historians. We do not even technically know what Cato means, it's something dealing with firmness, and of course like his broader character, something positive, reliable, um, say coherent. Uh, and and more. Um, this figure is mm, quite fascinating. It's essentially in a text to his literary activity that was not his main one. Uh, by the way, the better known Roman historical figure before Cicero and Kaiser, and we will see now, of course, also better why, because not all, in fact, this is the point, that not all, especially Roman aristocrats by this time were to leave uh, any significant uh, literary work and uh, you must understand why he did that even though he was quite of a conservative to say the least just for the record he was born in 234 uh, and he died in 149 BC so we're talking uh, some of the most important uh, which ones are not also before and after, telling the truth, moments of, of Roman history, but specifically the one of Roman uh, expansion in the Mediterranean. Cato was a veteran of the Second Punic War. He went through basically the, the Roman conquest of Greece, in which he had also an important part. I talked about him in for the Battle of the Thermopylae of 191 BC during the Seleucid invasion of Greece. Um, if you have watched that video about the Macedonian phalanx versus the the Roman manipular legion, the the top topic of all topics that of course I had to make a video about just as my very short introduction, so I think it's like two hours and a half, and it, it was actually after a, a little thesis that I wrote during my master degree, which I analyzed all the sources, like the primary sources available on all the encounters between the, the Roman um, legion and, and the Macedonian phalanx in broadly meant, um, in which, you know, that, um, in fact, Cato had uh, an interesting role. He emerged from the one of the hidden paths of, of, of the Thermopylae Pass, and he, even though he didn't have a consistent uh, retinue, uh, apparently he scared the hell out of his Seleucids that thought that there was a massive Roman force that had just outflanked them, and this brought actually to the Roman victory. Um, and uh, it's, say, I, I make many videos about Roman history. I think at some point we will be increasing the frequency as well as some other sub cycles, um, other topics uh, exhaust themselves. I will um, replace them, likely mostly, not entirely, with, with Roman uh, history content. But we rarely talk about like single historical figures. Um, I'm not a sucker for biographies necessarily. I like to know the the characters well from an individual point of view, but I think they make sense only if you sort of uh, uh, tailor the the broader context like the, and dimension and background to their personas to understand why these in fact were, were so important, right? And this is a bit what we're going to do today. This is not the, the definitive video about Cato the Elder's biography, right? But there are some aspects that are relevant uh, about his personality to approach, in fact, his uh, times um, and places through, through the same, right? Um, and there are really lots of things we could simply start from. One that is... Uh, say banal but not so banal in this broader context uh, Cato was a novus homo um, that is to say essentially the first of his um, of his family uh, not to have served in the Roman Senate more specifically to, to be elected as consul this is part of a broader um, context that especially after the Battle of Cannae and the, the, the bloodshed of uh, the, the bloodbath of, of the Roman nobility uh, brought many families from 
the the lower ranks, right? Not lower estates, but still aristocrats, of course. Cato was from an ancient plebeian family that, as you know, had their own um, aristocracy and, of course, were part of of the senatorial system um, at this point. Uh, and so, again, not the classist division of um, Marxistic uh, idea that we have when we talk about the people in, in general. Um, Marcus Parcus Cato is important for us as witness, in part, and in other ways as literal critic, judge, if you want, of his own times. Right, Cato was famous not just because of imposing uh, figure, sort of grim uh, gaze, and sort of this um, persona that exuded um, autoritas, um, because of his adherence to the to the to the older Morris, right? But he was also very, in fact, um, rigid, stern, and extremely. Uh, even pugnacious against specifically the Hellenization of Roman culture that would never be like a full accomplishment, right? Many people think at some point the Romans became Greeks in, in everything, culturally speaking. That's not quite the case. But this was a time in history that in fact we have been not generally told in the degree of Roman uh, austerity. Like the, what what the, we intend, generally speaking, as as Romans are you know, the, the civilized uh, people, right? The idea of you know, whoever founded this this greater culture that we mostly celebrate for the the civilian and sort of um, artistic or architectural uh, accomplishment, etc. This is not quite the uh, the the idea we should have in a in a broader sense because the Romans emerged from an incredibly and positively meant primitive, brutal, and um, even somehow uh, rough, even backwards, background. They were emerging just right now, these incredibly loaded people that truly had the deep conviction that the world had to basically go under the rule, and that um, the, um, the, the, the religious beliefs were all one with their political um, vision, with the sense that, in fact, there was a, a divine standard that you couldn't come short um, more than much. It was true for every people at the time, but uh, at this point, the, the Romans being on the rise to an, ex an unprecedented extent had to confront themselves with the practical difficulties of running was what was a true empire, fundamentally, um, and of Mediterranean scale, and uh, let's say modulating the relation with the much more, say, advanced uh, uh, Hellenistic culture in at least those, say, in other fields that now had, um, let's say, however, brought the same culture to, to an important stagnation or softens compared to this Roman wedge. Again, it was much more warlike also. Than, and, um, and aggressive, like in, in tone, in, in posture. And so Cato represents uh, one of those that, even though having uh, a relatively more humble origin than the single most ultra-patrician senatorial families of, of tradition, um, descending from, from gods openly, etc., would, um, uh, would in incarnate to show essentially how much the establishment had to, to hold that. And you know that the second century would witness uh, an important crisis in the, in the Roman Respublica, that is the, the recruitment one, a bit like a, a paralysis in front of the, the first uh, expansion had been quite successful, but that had somehow produced, in fact, all these, had um, satisfied in part um, the establishment uh, that was fearing the, the rise of one sort of mon potentially monarchic figure. Cato is in part like that, of course, because of the suspicion towards the Scipiones that were in fact the most, um, among the most Hellenized of, of the Roman clans, uh, and that 
had the, the accomplishments on the battlefield to claim that sort of superiority. It was a ferocious struggle and competition of a of um of a dominion that by now was of course more concerned with this um say internal disputes rather than external threats, frankly, at least Kato lived in the the years that knocked out again the, the main um Carthaginian and Hellenistic threat. Um and that as such uh, make us reflect on how much Rome changed after all and how much of the elite was, was seeing this growth after all uh, also as a form of moral decadence because of the the more relaxed tone that uh, the spoils had allowed the Romans to leap and even though as we saw in other videos about for example the capture the destruction of Carthage and Corinth so in the mid 2nd century BC the Romans were morally speaking just capable of some most violent and ruthless and absolutely, you know, also iron-motivated, um, logically speaking and politically, um, actions uh, against their their enemies or somebody they had to make an example of because of deterrent reasons, for example. Some scholars point out from his works that Cato would have really not at least cared too much about certain aspects of certain dynamics that were going on in the same Roman society at the time. First and foremost, the ones that would trigger, in fact, the second century crisis, the recruitment um, uh, crisis proper, the peasantly um, impoverishment that is the in fact, the one that somehow is more connected with his work on on the countryside and the the duties of a of a true Roman uh, land worker, as naturally as a, you know, as an as a, as a landowner, like controlling the slaves and all. In, in this, he's very uh, again ideal in the especially in, in the primitive ancestral traditional ways. Um, of the Romans, but at the same time he seems blind to the crisis of the Roman middle class that objectively was was going under um, uh, while in fact the aristocracy was was taking over pretty much well also the, the enormous amount of land that Rome had now consolidated um, especially in Italy under you know after, after the second Punic War the, the confiscations um, from the from the unloyal allies, but also of course the great riches um, overseas that were, however, a matter of concern for the same aristocracy because those who profited more from an Hellenistic policy were um, the ones for pushing also more for an equestrian, um, uh, let's say, wealth that would have supported specific uh, senatorial leaders, as opposed to the more conservative. Uh, agricultural sort of continental um, uh, aristocracy picked the one of uh, Quintus Fabius Maximus even as, as an opposer in fact of Scipio's plan to bring the war into Africa um, which if followed would have actually brought the, the situation back at the beginning of the war in some way so we're not going to talk about this but there are lots of middle grounds, sort of grey areas. Um, my take on Cato's um, awareness, of course, is that we do not know everything about what he actually believed in or what he knew or what he wanted to, to show, by the way, and, and not, right? Because we will see that even though, for example, he was very adverse to the Hellenization of Roman culture, he actually knew Hellenic culture pretty well. Um, he was a learned man and he just knew what, say, the same Roman culture had been managed to, to absorb uh, since the, the first uh, Punic War. There had been other uh, Romano-Italic authors that had been writing in Greek, etc. And he, for example, decided to write himself, even though this was for the most rigid customs of um, Roman morality, a sort of shame in itself, because the, the true Roman does not write. He's not a man of letters, he's a warrior, right? So literature is for the, the effeminated. Well, at this point, um, after the Second Punic War, the, the, the Romans have gone beyond even this, this mentality, in spite of their incredible 
suspicion on on this broader external influences but they they are able to for example with Kato being the, the best representation of this like beginning to write in Latin for Latin readers right for for a Roman audience specifically and not just let's say imitating other people's models and this this does give to Roman Italic history actually an important um, qualification uh, but from, from a literary point of view um, we of course have to just admire how uh, Cato's long and intense uh, life and activity had influenced in a in fact in a relevant a relevant way on uh, Roman society even though this took a turn that he would have not fully uh, appreciated on the longer run with further Hellenization of of, um, of the Mars. Uh, still, however, he was not an isolated figure, right? He was not just like a grumpy crow uh, sitting there and, you know, um, demonizing his opponents. He had a, a brilliant uh, record, brilliant career uh, and curriculum. All right, um, Gaius Flaminius had been another one of these great political figures for a homo novus, right? Um, but it was somehow, in fact, still exceptional, right? He also won all the 44 trials under which he went because of his enemies' attacks politically. We know, by the way, that at the beginning of his public life, he had been backed by the eminent patrician Lucius Valerius Flaccus, that would be later on a colleague of his in consulship and, and censorship. Um, Cato was native of Tusculum in the southeast of Rome. Even though he would grow up in a Sabinian farmland in the northeast of Rome, a traditionally pastoral area, that sort of incarnated, in fact, the, the model of the ancestral uh, Indo-European, in fact, pastoral uh, devotion of, of, of the Italic peoples, um, that, in fact, would have led into the Roman, uh, say, aristocracy in, the, in their land holdings, and in, 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 the, in a way, as we will see now, that Cato provides us uh, many details about literally how running a, a Roman villa, enjoying its autumn, handling the slaves, um, and making, you know, uh, wealth. Because the idea, of course, uh, at the time in, in, in the Catholic um, connection was the more power you get, of course, and the more God is, you know, re has been rewarding you for, for your works. Uh, in the first place, and so success, merit, right, hard work, these are all you know important Western principles that are reconfirmed always in the in the Catholic. In, in, still, in parallel with a s sacrifice um, that is also represented by Cato's uh, career and service uh, for his fatherland, and, and more so, not just uh, uh, you know an inch like a separated um, enrichment that actually uh, out of society like this was anti-Roman right uh, the Roman aristocracy was always redistributing always rain vesting right because they thought that a wealth not spent was still sort of a uh, just rotting away right it, uh, preventing from the, the individual from reaching the higher role that through this power this acquired and deserved, earned wealth he could have, um, he could have achieved. Um, so, as we just said, Cato's attempt to uh, counter the influence of Hellenic culture in Rome would be largely vain. I mean, there was nothing at that point you could do that this um, Italian people was entering the the broader Mediterranean culture dominated by Hellenism and so if they wanted, especially as the Romans were now expanding, pr properly controlling the coastlands, not much the interland as a wall, uh, in the main 
Hellenistic centers of Hellenic culture and of great, of course, um, um, tradition, they would have necessarily had to, to learn at least how to handle that, right, in order to, to rule over uh, these peoples that themselves had, of course, um, shown at some point in history that Rome here was crushing foes like the the Antigonids, the Seleucids, so not really, um, you know, some some children as far as the the broader imperial ecumenic ambitions were were concerned. Alexander's example was quite fresh and alive in 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 Roman memory. They they didn't distinguish in this sense between races if, when you literally have the that man touching divinity uh, himself and of course the Romans thought to be ipso facto just superior to, to the Greeks in, in the first place and though uh, in, in these generations there was still some sort of uh, anxiety and, and nervousism from from the Roman side for example when having to face for the first time the Hellenistic phalanx in the Atlantic homeland, right? One thing had been Pyrrhus, but, you know, before Cunus Cephali, the Romans were not so um, so sure or um, confident as they would be before Pugna, uh, uh, or before Magnesia, for that even. So, um, afterwards, so, this is a, a moment of m maturation, right, of, of Roman dominance in Mediterranean at, at, at a very deep and sort of metaphysical level. And that's why Cato knew that lowering the guard regarding the, especially the, uh, the luxurious lifestyle of the, you know, less um, morally tight Greeks that objectively, if you read, for example, even in, in military discipline, the, the statutes of Amphipolis, like the 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 Macedons were still say of course they were a, a, a might to be rec uh, reckoned with in, in a general sense but it, it's evident for example their discipline was mus much less rigid on papyrus we can say than than the Roman one it was again just by background much more ruthless and and sanguinary. And that would make, in fact, a hell of a difference for that uh, in, for that matter. Now, um, uh, such orientation of Cato was one of the factors that, within the same Roman politics, brought him to fight the Scipiones and Flamininus, because these had been the ones who had crushed, respectively, the Carthaginians and the Macedonians, or just even the Scipiones did. Uh, the same against the Seleucids as well. Um, and so going hand in hand with the broader um, process of uh, Mediterranean conquest that rose many perplexities within the, the Roman Senate regarding the, the fame, the fortune of these uh, quasi-gods, objectively like the, following the, uh, the footsteps of Alexander was uh, in, in a strongly anti-monarchical or at least, you know, highly competitive system like the, the senatorial one, because it's, it's not that they were just, say, institutionally against the monarchy in itself. This had proceeded from the recognition of a certain level of human decadence that had um, scorporated, as you know, the, uh, the, the the concept of royal sacrality. I made a video about the Sol Invictus, that, of course, was the, the one in you know, in, in the origin, in the ancestral belief of, of the Indo-European peoples, that was incarnated by the the the, the kings, right, in, in, in the Roman sagas, and that, however, had lost um, many, uh, say, had been split into the, the various magistracies. Think about the the the, the pontifex, and again, the, the the actual function of creating a bridge between the deity. And, and mankind again this, this is all part of the, the theology that these Roman noblemen were quite aware of but that in this contextual balance of power with, within the various houses uh, historically 
had made them timid regarding the possibility of just one of them having the, the actual power to tame this. Um, what was becoming, just as a group, functionally, the, the one dominating over such an extensive um, empire, even over those same people that had generated Alexander, so automatically showing that the Romans could have had their own as well, and somebody like Scipio Africanus, of course, was the sort of most uh, preferable like uh, example in, in, in that direction. They knew that. They were dealing with kings also privately. We, we talked about the trials against the Scipiones in another video. In fact, it is connected somewhat uh, with this, as Cato was one of the main opponents of, of the same. And, in fact, the, the final victory on the Scipiones would not stop the spread of Hellenism in Rome, and, in fact, the same Cato in his er, uh, elderly age was in optimal relations with other Philo-Hellenic uh, Romans. For example, his firstborn son married Aemilia, the daughter of Lucius Aemilius Paulus, the conqueror of Macedon. We talked about him and also the way these Philo-Hellenics actually treated, of course, the subjected Greeks um, to some extent. The Romans, again, were not particularly, um, you know, uh, tender-hearted, if we, we can say, uh, in the first place. And this daughter was the same sister of um, Scipio Emilianus by... Um, and, and this, again, with the further expansion of the Third Punic War in um, the final conquest of, of Carthage, and so even there, uh, the, the reinforcement of the necessity, of, for example, of a seaborne Roman uh, capacity and the, you know, the, the increase of the of the Mediterranean traffic, and so how this would have affected the same Roman society out of this agricultural idyllium that, of course, the, the more uh, conservative landowners were just, um, you know, in fact, uh, idealizing. Even though, of course, they were in part the same profiting from the conquest of other provinces, but still with the growth of other uh, of other estates, such as the, the knights, the equitas. Um, in any case, um, because, you see, the, the problem was always the same. Like, if you have a monarch, the main or a preeminent figure, like a prince, um, the, the the best allies are those who are beneath the the nobility, that is the one that is going to counter you. So uh, the Aquitus, that by law could, uh, just by this stern Roman decency, just carry out certain, for example, commercial affairs that were considered to be, um, you know, degrading for, in fact, what had to be the true just landowner, right, of... Uh, ruling the the res publica rather than somebody who handled money and w was still alive there. In fact, for example, Cato banned uh, usury from from Sardinia and Corsica uh, back in the day. We will see it now. Um, but um, let's say th there was a an important consequence, e e even deriving from Cato's prejudice, that is to say arguing with his fellow citizens that had written uh, historical works in Greek, Cato, for th the first time, wrote a history of Rome and of all of Italy in Latin, the Origines, right? There are interesting chapters, like telling, for example, the, all the, the various... Uh, histories of foundation of various uh, Italian cities and, and, and Similia. Uh, it's very, very interesting works that basically gave birth to a new historiography that was authentically Roman for the mere fact that it was designed for a Roman audience in Latin and literally mm, cultivating this, this older Roman identity further, in a moment in which this was perceived as threatened, right, or in crisis to, to some extent. Now, the most uh, characteristic aspect of Cato's personality is surely the ostentation of moralism, um, 
to an extent that you understand was genuine, like he truly believed um, much of this, he understood of course how politically instrumental it was, but he gave proof um, of this standard uh, himself, uh, for example, like while exercising with great harshness uh, censorship in 184-83, uh, that is the, the, the moment in which he, the, the name, the cancer, the censor would, would stick, to him, um, so cancer cancerius par excellence. So the guy who, in fact, uh, judges to to, the, to discriminate with this um, harshness and uh, authority, and this attitude, as we just pointed out, had a political aim because it um, allowed him to um, enforce uh, a well the definite program of administrative correctness both in the relation between the state and the privates but also in, in the very way of governing the provinces and the Romans did need that because again this was new and there were lots of abuses and corruption uh, in general and so such harshness such um, will to like be out there and being targeted as we've seen politically against those who wanted to, to speculate out of this was after all still maintaining the, the banner of Roman morality high um, and yet uh, also in his moralizing campaigns Cato was somehow destined to um, to defeat to be defeated um, at least in a, in a broader sense. For example, he, uh, we, we just said it, he expelled all the usurers from Sardinia and Corsica when he governed um, these islands as Praetor in 198. This is, by the way, just after the end of, of, of the Second Punic War. So in a moment in which the Romans had even restarted, as you know, in the dealings between Scipio and Hannibal to, to actually to, to trade with Carthage, to... Um, in fact, to, to speculate vastly from also from these portal uh, uh, positions in the Iranian, uh, etc. And as it is notorious, usury would not disappear at all, right? And in fact, Cato was criticized for this already in antiquity because he would have uh, apparently had some sort of double standard that if you actually look at it, it's not quite correct, right? And this referred especially to the practice of the so-called Thanos Nauticum. This was essentially a loan practiced to ship owners, which was particularly despised because of how high the taxes of interest were. And this was, of course, due to the... Um, of course, the, the, the dangers uh, entity in this business, I mean, shipwrecks were definitely frequent. Um, there were still pirates around in spite of the, the Roman rise also to, to, a novel, to a novel extent. And this is interesting because if you look at, like, in, in the same region, like how we, we have seen it for the Middle Ages, the, the Italian maritime republics develop a, a lot of, you know, the the, the wealth, the say the investment, the the general um, profit did come from similar activities, right? But this is technically not usury, because if you look at Cato's activity, he was not say taking care personally of the actual shipping. Um, he was just investing his wealth in maritime trade, right? Which is also interesting because it, it was in part just reflecting how the same Roman uh, aristocracy watching more at say, the conservative ideals was still, of course, uh, in the race, participating to this new lucrative business, right? Um, he could have not owned ships in the first place because there had been, specifically in Roman history, we'll see it, a plebiscitum, uh, the Claudian one, which specifically forbade the senators to to do so right because it was really intended as you know these guys are going to get 
too much power. After all, the equitas were in a way or another clients of these other, um, say, of, 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 the, of, of the senatorial order. So everything would remain under some, some control. And here, of course, Cato was investing um, among his own clients uh, as well, right? And um, he was doing so, um, by the way, using different middlemen, um, some freedmen specifically, uh, that um, was uh, involved in the, as a as a as an associate in a company of ship builders, and, and this was particularly relevant because again it was part of that sense of mm, private dimension of these various households and in their clients' a relationship, not. In the, I'd say in the hands of a single person, just per se, it would have probably not even made sense uh, overall. But usually, was it was a different story, right? Usually, would just you know, I'll give you a certain amount of money that you have to give me back after a while. Uh, that was, you see, this, this was a Christian law, for example, uh, later on, because it was anti-Catholic. It was just thinking that. Uh, uh, you you would give the illusion of, of wealth created out of factual nothing because it was not material wealth, um, not even precious metals that would eventually accomplish a deed, right? If there wasn't a morality involved. Of course, um, the Romans thought the, the Imperium manifested through the same wealth, but it, it also depended on what did this wealth come from? Where by weakening somebody else, right, obliging him to basically um, indebt himself was seen as, uh, towards other Romans, right, as an incredibly negative thing, uh, given that the Kivas had to maintain the standard of freedom, um, so in the sense of bearing arms and being able, in fact, to expand that Roman moral virtue. Yeah, so it was not just about the the, the scam of usury, but also what this entailed as as the 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 uh, the willful degradation of a fellow Roman, right? In in a in a in fact intentional way, just to make this guy weaker and so and aspiring to the greater positions, but not in absolute terms, just in relative terms, because you had made that outer Roman poorer, right? Even though, again, uh, as we just saw in, in a society that, that firmly believed that the work, I don't know, from, from the field was um, reflecting the, the, the same imperium of a person, the same divine blessing that, and power that was conferred, bestowed upon the, this individual, right? Um, and uh, one could descend in all the various uh, biological and material considerations of this, like the, the countryside is cultivating life to some extent, whereas um, exchanging matter is, is just per se not. Um, in any case, um, Kato was uh, sort of a shareholder. Uh, it's, it's as simple as that, not a creditor of this ship-owning company, right? And in his De Agricultura, Again, his, his masterpiece, the, the Latin literature masterpiece about um, Roman landholding, um, Cato explained that sometimes it could be convenient to seek earning in commerce, right? It, this was not such a um, risky thing, right? Uh, the idea was not to be too bold, where right? it was a sense of prudentia, as, as the Romans called it, that was not about gambling about in a senseless way, I mean, the, the true Roman, as we've seen in the video about the Fortuna Kaiseris, had to absolutely identify with the second Clausewitzian person of, of the military man that just by definition loves gamble, r loves the, the loves risks, loves chances that uh, without risk uh, there is no reward. And so this, however, had to be calibrated on the basis of actual on the actual understanding of reality. There had to be some sort of um, providence involved that would make you guess right, gamble, 
correctly, right? Knowing what would happen later, and so even in that, in that, you know, manifesting your imperium, your divine connection, for that matter. Um, the consider that while he was uh, having this work written, um, the um, what what was risky uh, from a monetary point of view or economically in general was not so risky for him because he was among the richest men in Rome, so he could afford, of course, to invest big and to have great. Um, great revenues when things succeeded generally speaking that the greater enterprises were also some of the best protected by further you know covers that were in fact granted by the same politicians um, really remarkable is also another moral aspect of Cato um, as we just said the Romans were particularly brutal in the way they treated the defeated. I mean, the, the Romans were actually fair about that, right? If uh, they they liked peoples who did not surrender immediately, in any case, once you were defeated by Rome or you had surrendered yourself willingly, um, you could not rise again. Otherwise, they would wipe you out of, of the face of the earth. Sometimes, the, like in the ancient world, we wouldn't even have this possibility of just even going on existing, right, and having the possibility of being co-opted by this greater power that believed in the uh, in the manumission of these peoples to sort of give them a, a chance of redemption within their the Roman ecumenic rule. Uh, Cato was particularly tenacious in accusing those Roman commanders that had been um, responsible of crimes against enemies or former enemies. Um, because there was also a concept of fides um, that sort of informed the, the international relations. That if you gave your word and you, you know, you, you went by the rules, uh, certain things should have not happened to you. In 190 uh, BC, Cato attacked Quinctus Minucius Thermus because, without a motive, this had put to death some Ligurians that were um, essentially a northwestern uh, Italian people of um, uncertain origin. They had been Celticized to some extent, but it's just like the Basques. Uh, it just, we, we do not know exactly the, um, their originary, um, let's say, looking at this, you know, these were all mostly peoples who had been there for quite a long time, just the elites that at some point had come. Um, across the sea, um, or also from from other places, we just don't know. T um, but they had been particularly um, hostic towards the Romans. Uh, we will talk about the Ligurians at some point because they they had their own distinctive way of war, and they really, you know, obliged the Romans to commit a massive force trying to, to managing to ambush them at some point in in the Ligurian. Um, so-called Alps, even though they are Apennines, um, and, um, you know, being at some point deported, even as far as Samnium, right, to delude them, because they were so um, courageous uh, as far as their independence went. Um, so you, you may understand why Quinctus Minucius Thermus might have been frustrated by these people to, 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 to slaughter them. Um, and for this reason, Cato uh, succeeded in... Um, preventing uh, Thermus' triumph over the Ligurians uh, being celebrated, um, which was, of course, also quite a disappointment after an actually successful expedition. Right? During his censorship, he expelled from the Senate uh, Lucius Quinctius Flamininus because this commander had killed, by his own hand, a uh, chieftain of the Boyan Gauls of the Po Valley that had spontaneously handed himself over to the Romans. All right? And this was also a proof of, of course, Roman affirmation of this um, people that had supported the Carthaginians back in the Second Punic War, that they had been, again, a problem for Rome. And here, yet again, however, the, the, the Roman killed um, a 
surrender enemy, which was co not considered fair. Like uh, the Romans had all a uh, tradition of uh, duels, uh, championships, and the heroes connected with that, especially against the Gauls. So the idea is that uh, these guys should have at least been killed in a in a fair combat of some sort. Um, and in fact. The, the expulsion of, of, of this guy from the Senate was a, a pretty serious thing, right? That's how much the Romans cared about the worthiness of their imperium. In 149, so the, the same year of, of his death, at 85 years old, it's a lot for the times, and people cared about longevity because it was a mark of divinity, a group of, of, say, less degradation from the fall, and so a, a greater closeness to Jupiter. Um, Cato pronounced an oration against Servius Sulpicius Galba that had massacred treacherously uh, some Lusitanians after their surrender. This um, is, is interesting, aside from the fact that two years later these events would give rise to Viriatus' revolt. That actually wasn't much of a big deal. Um, the Romans were not particularly committed to the Iberian Peninsula. By the way, Cato um, celebrated a triumph after his government in Spain. Um, and these populations were witnessing that. They were witnessing the fact that the Romans after, these are the same again, 149 is the beginning of the Third Punic War, they, the Romans were beginning to realize um, that their position was solid because no people really was threatening the integrity of their, of their Mediterranean uh, Empire. Uh, concretely, but it was the sum of all these various weaknesses, mistakes, whatever. Again, infringing the fetus was a serious thing. You knew that there would have been a payback from from God. Um, so, Cato understood this and was even punishing those who indulge in these excesses. I mean, the the spirit of Rome was exactly what we said before. It's about redemption. It's not saying this was the great proud of uh, pride of the Romans. It's not about subjecting people and, and exterminating them, right? Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it does make sense politically, strategically, socially, whatever, but in general, like, as Romans, first of all, we're talking pre-industrial societies in which there is no such thing really like genocide, even just possibly carryable, right, and in scale. People use the term genocide because they, they think that genocide means lots of people killed. No, that's not what it means. It's It's the actual... Uh, motivation of, of why they kill, and the Romans did not care about that because they were Catholic, right? They believed uh, again in the possibility, like just like all these other peoples, that um, every man could, in theory, resume right a degree of divinity. And the Romans, aside from needing um, people's, uh, I mean, people in general to to exploit, right? Think about all these slaves deported after this conquest, etc. They were calibrating the the punishment so that it could be harsh, but in proportion, but also leaving always the opportunity for these people to to join the Roman fort, and so to elevate them like as the, the superior um, race to that divine standard. Right? It, it's very interesting, by the way, to read the the Agricultura and uh, about how the slaves were treated. Um, in the Roman villas. I mean, Cato is incredibly efficient um, in, in his mind. He says, you know, you have to make slaves work all the time um, uh, in, a, in a useful way, then those who are sick must be fed less. The, there is all an incredibly pragmatic, concrete way of handling this. this, this uh, these people that were, as you know, barely considered as such, because, of course, their status... Um, was inherently the one of an inferior person because of the sins that uh, had brought him to be a slave in the first place, um, whichever the origin of that. Um, and so this is not to say that Cato cared particularly about the slaughtered Lusitanians, and objectively, you know, who does? But the, the, the point was about the broader political spirit like that um, was meant to 
hegemonized the world um, from Rome herself. And so um, the Roman behavior had to be superior to low instincts of, let's say, just let's kill them all because after all they're a bunch of animals. Um, let's see what whether we can elevate them um, somewhere. And again, also the Barian front was incredibly frustrating. Uh, forever guerrilla, right? Uh, really, the Romans not giving a damn about Spain in the first place, just like the, the rich coast uh, on the Mediterranean, the interland being populated by this... Um, by these savages. Let, let, let's let's be honest about that. I, I made multiple videos about Iberian, Celtiberian warfare, including the Lusitanians. We'll come back on them, and we know what they had, what they were about. Right? It's not that they could ever dislodge the Romans from from Spain. Uh, at this point, the, the greater civilization had set foot um, firmly uh, in there. Later on, we would have had to wait for Biriatus that almost kicked out Pompey. Um, out of Cartagena, if I'm not uh, wrong, but at least in there there was an advanced process of Romanization. There were still Roman Roman legionaries, after all, um, next to the you know to, to the locals uh, that were surely exploited in, in rebellion. But um, that's sort of another uh, another story, right? In the latter. Um, case, however, of Galba, um, the guy was absolved, right? Other Roman generals would carry out um, equally um, vicious crimes against uh, the subjected population. So again, this is trying to maintain a standard and a virtue that here it's, it's the true Catholic struggle of the hero against the uh, the, the sins of the world that does not quite fully succeed because at least divine transfiguration is ever more distant uh, the more time passes. Um, the what could could digress further, but um, say that Cato's intransigence is, is what really here stands out in the, um, even, for example, safeguarding the interests of the community towards the, the publicans, right, as a censor, as a cancer agreeing with uh, Valerius Flaccus, he modified all the contracts stipulated by the previous cancers in a way to render them less costly for the state, right, so less favorable to these subcontractors, because most of the actual speculation at the end of the day in the system came from those that these, um, let's say, um, officials um, were, you know, were gaining just by being bribed by, by the local subcontractors in the provinces. And um, this brought to, in fact, the, the protests of the same Publicani that received the support of Titus Quinctius Flamininus, that was cancer in 189, 188 at the, uh, at, at the time, thus responsible of these contracts. Uh, in the time Cato had um, essentially uh, dismissed them, and even um, uh, some tribunes supported the Publicani after a long and complex trial, um, uh, that brought eventually, however, to Cato's victory. This this is interesting because it shows how this man was motivated still by uh, a general sense of justice for the state, and he was aware of the, the various mechanisms of exploitation that, at the end of the day, this, this other um, figures wanted to to foster because these publicani were their own clients right it's as simple as that so the attempt to um deprivatize right to to maintain some public authority in the face of a word again that was changing after can I, some imputed in fact the second century crisis exactly to this there were new New rulers, new a new Roman establishment that had been diluted from the probably the, the truest 
you know, most ancient one by all these newcomers that were sort of more shady figures in at least their relation with business that were now open to this hallucinating wealth coming from from the Mediterranean and so all the higher values were, were under threat. Um, Cato and Flaccus uh, followers in censorship uh, in the years 179 and 174 73 uh, did not want or did not dare to imitate this um, clash um, against the, the 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 two figures because they were so well respected also mirroring this um, patrician and plebeian elite alliance uh, as far as this moral standards were concerned because this would have attracted too much um, uh, backlash against them. I mean, Flaccus and Cato represented the uh, very powerful duo as best representatives of, of the patrician and the plebeian elites joined. And after their censorship, um, of course, nobody could be as much as they had been. Uh, the Publicani, as a consequence, obtained a new uh, lavish uh, earnings at Statal expenses due to uh, corruption and embezzlement, and uh, this um, this was a trend that, as you know, would continue um, going on. There would, there would be a return to Catonian rigor in 169-68 um, under the censorship of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. We never talked about the Gracchi, as a matter of fact. That's uh, a must, of course, for the understanding, especially of the death of the, let's say, the agony in the beginning uh, of the of the agony of the republic. The so-called republic never really existed as a type of regime, whatever. It's just a, um, it's something we will see better definitionally at another point. Um, also, under Appius Claudius Pulcher, as a matter of fact, and at at that point the Publicans' reaction was violent, um, showing how much they had entrenched themselves in their privileges and power. By the way, so um, the, the the censors at that point were accused, even to have offended um, plebeian tribune, right? And as such, they, you know, that these guys could not be properly touched. That they had. Um, or a set of privileges to maintain that uh, um, that that balance with the consular power, right? And uh, the censors, for this reason, of course, these were also um, thus magistrates provided with lesser degree of uh, imperium, right? Com comparatively, the the consuls at at, at some point during this the, the crisis of recruitment would be stopped by the same plebeian tribunes right because they were sort of just harvesting the, the peasants to, to send them over to, to Spain say um, and uh, the, the censors here for having opposed public and power backed by the plebeian tribunes mm, risked right not just um, to, to lose this uh, trial, out of which they actually came out uh, um, untouched because of uh, only of Gracchus' great popularity, right? But um, because, of course, these were the times in which violence would start being used much more frequently in Roman uh, politics and public um, public scenery, right? There was some legacy, however, that Cato had sent, and so the same censors would not give up. By the way, um, uh, as um, uh, as you know, they 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 went on even getting killed in the end, uh, aware of um, the let's say what was at stake, and that Cato had already identified. Right, it was nothing here about uh, the 
contemporary sense of rights uh, or justice, at least the ones that we have decided to have been there. Here there was the awareness of Romans' right to rule over the world and uh, the, the same one about the, the fact that if the system had been eroding itself, it would have been very difficult to, uh, to preserve the order. Right. Naturally, things change and power exists even beyond these mechanisms so that Rome would rise. But only when the um, powers of those who were profiting illicitly were, were sort of contained. And so also the, the later uh, Roman monarchy right, in, during the, the Principate would actually be part of the same mechanism, paradoxically. Um, it considered that after this Catonian phase, by the way, we do not have such detailed information about the same censor's behavior anymore, right? We know that the publicans' force uh, as a pressure group uh, increased because their power was increasing, their wealth was increasing. The people who were backing them, of course, were becoming more... Uh, protective of their clients um, there was all a uh, speculation phenomenon that arrived to touch even some of the most important assets of the Roman dominion for example the Macedonian mines that were um, closed in 167 exactly to prevent that the publicans interference uh, in the events or, or in the life in the politics of the four republics of, of Macedon that had been established after, in fact, the the conquest that had occurred exactly 168, 167, um, were reopened by the publicans in, uh, I mean, just by at least the, the political uh, current who was supporting the state of affairs already in 158, right? So you realize how forces like Cato, who was still alive, by the way, were, in a sense, powerless or not enough, at least to, to let this, uh, this dam uh, break. Um, so this is an important legacy that Cato left um, in Roman politics uh, and society for this fixing this mid uh, second century crisis consider again a guy living up to 85 year old in such an incredibly eventful period of Roman history and realizing that that world he had been rising into that was coming just from the, to the full affirmation of uh, Rome in, in Italy as a power that now had taken over practically the, the entire Mediterranean was still, however, being eroded by a new establishment that was not worth the one of the, the older Mars and the, again, very rigid, um, let's say, value system that uh, had been leaving into individuals like Cato as well, right? And I would dedicate um, the last part of this video to um, Cato's De Agricultura, that again is one of the most important works. Uh, at some point we could make a series um, about Latin literature as a whole, which this is, this is really a masterpiece in many ways. I mean, it's not a, like, unfortunately, the way he has gotten to us from certain medieval manuscripts shows us that the text has been altered in some way. Um, I mean, not to the extent really of making it uh, unrecognizable or just saying this is not Cato conceptually but in ways that uh, at least show us that it was not written exactly with the same structure and um, so the, it has to be treated uh, in its Latin also in, in some way but the content is pretty eloquent in itself um, Cato was mimicking a bit uh, figures like Curius Dentatus, uh, Flaminius, Fabius Maximus, he, in other words, was presenting himself a bit like the, um, the defender 
and the uh, the supporter of the rural plebs, right? Um, this is evidently not uh, the what, what the reality was about because he was an aristocrat in the first place, and so the, the majority of the Italic peasantry was not exactly living in the same conditions he was, but especially he, it, they were being dispossessed by the same oligarchs of large swaths of um, of land, and, and or at least they were becoming de facto some sort of colonists under somebody else's condition, in, in, again, in some great landowner's property because they couldn't sustain themselves easily anymore. They didn't have the means. Very often the same slaves of the great land owners would coerce these people into uh, obedience. All right, so it was a dramatic uh, situation. From some fragment of Cato's orations, we can um, definitely see that he um, attacked the usurpations of Agar Publicus. That was the the land, uh, the public land, in fact, that the Romans opened to any citizen after the conquest uh, of other communities. And so the, the Agar Publicus normally was created after the entire land of a people was confiscated, or at least the largest walls of that in the harshest punishments, because otherwise, and especially here we're talking about the post- um, say, during the Roman conquest of Italy, during the Second Punic War, there had been some communities that had rebelled to the Romans to the extent they, there would be all this confiscated land in Italy, publicly available, which meant that you could literally settle on it in any place. There was no limit, right? And this aspect was, in fact, what also the Gracchi later would contest to some extent, because um, some limits in a... Say, in order to prevent this kind of abuses and creation of enormous signories um, was part, as we've seen in the same Roman political debate, um, it's obvious that the people with more power could simply occupy larger parts. They had the, the resources just to invest in to create major farmlands um, and uh, just being under their own single property, whereas the the, the Roman uh, citizen soldier would normally just have his own land plot was enough in theory just to provide for his own equipment or an equivalent of that. Um, so, of course, the Roman uh, military machine uh, since the, the, the beginning of the Roman conquest of Italy, as we've seen, especially last year, in a series dedicated to this, had been founded on this balance, right? This balance had existed, obviously, between various estates in Rome. There had always been the, the richer landowners, and then the people in the 4th century BC was fundamentally allowed to participate to this, um, like, as far as the lands of, of the enemies were, were, were distributed um, through, their, through their accomplishment. And so... Um, joining the military with with the actual rights. That's how the, the plebeians had gotten uh, imperial magistracies, right? And so how the entire mil Roman military machine had started, right? And at this point, uh, Rome had again expanded dramatically. The the there hadn't been really a check uh, on this um, uh, agar publicus. Uh, it's a subdivision, right? And even though, yes, there were some level of districtuations that are discounted mostly for the political, like how many people had settled there in the first place. Um, but of course, um, the the broader control on the communities depended on this massive clientele, largely based on the, the latifundum. Um, and so, when you look at Cato, he was one of those same people in some way. I mean, that the system had never been different, but of course the problems, especially in, uh, in the in the army's recruitment, whereas uh, most uh, levies were 
essentially incapable of providing with their own equipment. And so already actually from from the Second Punic War, we really have something which would have been formalized with Marius as far as the, the state taking care of this, but in parallel, these people becoming proletarians de facto. is all a dynamic that Cato, just by extraction, obviously could not denounce fully, right? He just politically defended the... Um, say the idea but he uh, for, for what we can see wouldn't do anything concrete in order to put an end to the abuses and even though we do not know literally everything that Cato ever did um, uh, while it's possible that he took uh, some initiative in merit it's at least certain that he uh, didn't obtain any significant uh, or any result uh, so in the the agricultura um, Cato describes what was called the bonus agricola bonusque colonus the vir bonus colendi peritus that is respectively the good uh, agriculturer that is the, the good colonist or the good man uh, experienced in in agriculture proper the, the agriculture is an ablative uh, of subject like that means literally like the on the cultivation of of the field all right um and the the mo this model of course corresponds to what should have been the old roman uh peasant soldier right a person provided with massive uh, physical and moral backbone Cato was sort of you know incarnating this um, that uh, would have been also uh, in fact a Roman citizen as much as a valiant soldier because as we were just recalling just in tradition the more land you had and the the more you had to contribute to the army right this was the case in in Romanity, of course, it was a privilege just to belong to the higher classes uh, of recruitment. Um, historically, things again were sort of changing, but this is this had been also the way. In fact, that say the Equitas had distinguished themselves as a as an order, uh, differently from those who fought on foot. That at the end of the day, were here losing power. Uh, all together, right? Um, and this work is surely a, a pastoral idyllium of some sort. Surely that the Romans had been about this historically. The, the Italic peoples had uh, pastoral lifestyle from the time of the, the, their migration from Central Europe back in between the second and the first millennium BC. They brought. Um, this lifestyle, this archaic, uh, warlike mentality, to, to, together with them, at, at the root of uh, Latin uh, Roman culture, um, and Cato is pointing at that. It's a work that, of course, was not meant to chronicistically document what was occurring in the. His work was written around 160 BC when. The guy was pretty old, um, and so there is some sort of romanticism, and even uh, again, look at the past, the good old times, uh, and so on. Um, the point that is being made is that in this work, there is not, however, much of the problems that these, um, especially these small landowners, the numerical backbone of the Roman soldiery, were experiencing. Cato, however, doesn't um, describe even just the single most um, luxury uh, context, right, of the, the, the one of the, the largest farmlands that he also, uh, of course, owned, because he was, again, incredibly powerful uh, and rich, um, and in part also because of his land management capacity we can expect he was mostly looking at the middle ground right the 
uh, medium-sized farms cultivated by slaves uh, largely and so it's um, it's difficult that to, to think that Cato was just oblivious of the problems of, of the Roman peasantry as a whole right but it is sometimes true that even if you belong to a certain estate you you tend to be blind even to what what was happening to those elements of the same uh, of the same group that however is maybe less um, successful than you in part this derived again from the idea that if you everybody can make uh, this is the Roman dream you know everybody can make fortune through uh, warfare and a uh, land m exploitation and uh, the more you conquer the more slaves can work for you it, it's really the traditional principle that all the warriors of antiquity had always maintained but naturally at this point the system was particularly complex and Roman society incredibly articulated so um, as we've seen Cato fought all his life against uh, most of what made these issues but uh, there wasn't much it was like a landslide that could not be simply uh, uh, but say originated right by um, by this pure moral example at least in, in this particular moment of history for the reaction that others had right by the way Cato during his magistracies had an important infrastructural uh, tasking for example he restored the uh, Aqua Claudia the first aqueduct of Rome he built even though we do not know which the, the first basilica in the Roman Forum I mean the guy was really uh, was really important he even uh, was sent to watch over Scipio uh, I mean the would-be Africanus in the very expedition to Africa he watched over especially the supplies the ships the you know all the logistical side of the story this is particularly important because in a way or another he had had to cooperate with Scipio as, as we were saying before he participated to the battle of the um, Thermopylae and he basically had this this fascinating role of outflanking the Seleucids with his with a hand with a few men that however was enough as a psychological shock right uh, for the Seleucids and of course he would have bragged about this or at least maybe not because he was all stern etc but you know just the Seleucid army retreating um collapsing because he appeared right radiating his sword from one of the secret passages um behind the Thermopylae pass is is actually quite quite iconic right the guy had a hell of a military curriculum reputation during uh, again the, he had been there in the most critical moments of the Annibalic war he had been watching over all these um political issues so uh, really a, a great man but one who could even take this very important step as we've seen civilizationally of deliberately creating um, a Latin literature for a political Roman audience it's incredibly relevant um, Cato was enormously successful uh, finally um, actually this is what I want to conclude with in international politics right which always reveals actually some of the greatest skills of a of a people and of a ruler after the Scipiones fell um, uh, an event to which as we've seen the same Cato had contributed and after the death of Flamininus he basically would collect their uh, inheritance right their legacy in actually agreeing to uh, supporting an hegemonic imperialism for the for the program good let's say of, of the Roman people this is significant because he understood what the Roman potential was in the first place again the Romans were not really 
siding from like a, a pro imperial or anti imperial expansion, right? They they were opting for it in the first place, but the methods were sort of uh, varying, right? Um, Cattle had, however, some balance in this, some you know interesting proceedings. For example, he initially thought that it was important not to keep on expanding simply but to consolidate the newly acquired territories that were again quite important ones especially Greece um, and um, and Asia Minor he had been in Spain at that point already um, so he knew what the entirety of the Roman Dominion really is as, as we've seen he is also cultivated in historical um, say background he inspired himself to some previous authors Flavius uh, Fabius Pictor etc but let's say he also contributed with some uh, local traditions right he was interested in the history of the various communities he had fought in Greece um, etc um, he even defended the liberty of the Rhodians that as you know would hold out against the Romans in a historical perspective for quite long um, as there was at this point still the general idea uh, that in fact we've seen being broken in exactly after Cato's death that the Greeks had to be treated with some regards because again they had been the, the race of Alexander and um, the same Megas had used to uh, simply enter the enemy cities of course also through warfare but principally like the ones that would immediately recognize his divinity just without needing to fight so the Romans were sort of planning on doing the same because we were very powerful they could just scare um, especially these minor uh, Greek powers to subjection um, but they were also aware of like simply uh, the, the value of hegemonizing them without simply uh, conquering them but tying them increasingly to their power was still a way as we've seen the Saint Cato invested in maritime trade extensively and of course these were some of the most important I mean roads one of the most important ports uh, of antiquity uh, with trading with the Levant and again connecting Rome with some of the, the greatest intercontinental routes so everything made sense right it's the same line that prevailed even with Carthage that became a massive Roman trade partner after the second Punic War even though as we well know Cato was the coiner of the famous phrase um, uh, Carthago Belenda Caterum Autem Cancel Carthaginem esse delendam. So among the other things, I also think that Carthage should be destroyed. And the reason being, um, at least at that point, um, uh, so he after his death, this legacy would would be fully embraced um, by the Romans. There was um, still a uh, tolerance that the Romans had showed towards some powers that needed to be sacrificed at least in order to regain some deterrent capacity over the Mediterranean right away especially con it was not much the destruction of Carthage that impressed the ancient world but the one of Corinth because Corinth was really an Hellenic capital the Carthaginians after all yes they were an Hellenistic power in, by adoption let's say but they of course belonged to a very different culture from the Hellenic one and as such they had also uh, threatened uh, Roman existence from some sort of more deeply um, anti-Indo-European Apollonian way. I made a video about the moral uh, superiority of Roman civilization that explains how uh, the Romans managed to essentially subvert uh, the Pelagization of the Mediterranean and restoring the, the Apollonian um, virility um, and eagle and uh, 
um, broader heavenly control on the world and so this was increasing by the, the, the empire was, was expanding manifesting his divine potential um, so that's quite an interesting topic as well at some point to to analyze and um, Cato believed deeply in this so Carthage was in many ways the um, let's say first of all the product of that Scipionist policy towards, I mean, the, the same Scipio had defeated Hannibal, but the, being the first who had succeeded, say, pushed and eventually succeeded for the for sparing Carthage, right? And this other side of the Senate, including Cato, had instead pushed atrociously for 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 wiping Carthage out because. I mean, let's be honest, these were the same people who had been fighting against Carthage that would be, as we've seen, even from, uh, you know, all those commanders that the same Cato reprimanded and had, in some cases, condemned, like a, um, like a Roman reaction to, to enemy resilience and in a general uh, sense of revenge that Rome had to take against particu these particular enemies, Carthage really represented in many ways the snake in the West that had managed to, to, to threaten the same existence of the Romano-Italic Confederacy, where it had proven stronger but that had not dealt before the Third Punic War the, the actual blow. Right By that time, Carthage was just uh, inoffensive. They would have never regained um, related uh, comparable power to the one prior to the Second Punic War but uh, Cato's words um, accompanied by a basket of figs that he had brought back from Carthage right was um, to 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 evidence how much this the city was unfairly surviving um, where he had brought so much, uh, say, destruction and and um, and dread to to the Romans, and was still somehow standing. So that that's objectively a compromise. I mean, ideologically speaking, you understand why Carthage um, would have would have been targeted in that that way by someone who was in in the in the midst of the Second Punic War, risking his life, seeing his um, comrades falling, so the sense is um, is obvious. There, there was some opening, there was some acquiescence, but um, Carthage herself was the emblem of Roman tolerance and um, philo Hellenism, or at least in say a broader uh, sense of partnership with peoples that the more conservative elements of the Roman uh, the, of the Roman world were not considering at least archetypically as the, um, the the right partners the right and someone who could maintain that level of of autonomy and keeping to influence Rome uh, in in a moment of great uh, difficulty in maintaining the upper hand in the defense in the stability, if anything, of the provinces with some peoples that uh, were trying to rebel against the Romans, again, without too much fortune, but still uh, with some level of coordination, and so showing that that Roman star was sort of being obfuscated by the same moral issues of the Roman people. And so Cato was operating by trying to wash the, away this disdain, right, and bringing Rome to a next step. And you can argue that it was also thanks to figures like him that eventually Rome, in spite of the the generation of the, the institutional system that had been affirmed by this point, would be able still to grow and to maintain certain moral standards that differentiated it from the other peoples that it conquered and that they ruled over. Um, so these are all things that I exemplified. There is another video uh, which is titled like the 
do not wrong the evolution of Roman foreign policy exactly during these years that can be useful to to understand why Rome shifted um, the say that from tolerance to something way harsher and uh, recently also made another video about um, it's titled Gravitas versus Luxuria the destruction of Carthage and Corinth and, and the embellishment of Rome in the process as well so this is something you want to really uh, say evaluate in perspective I talk about uh, about Cato in that video as well and make a bit clearer what the Romans really thought at the time about um, the general you know destiny of their own people right? so never forget about this that it's not like an impersonally political reality um, not just you have these individuals like Cato that remain in history because of their um, incredibly archaic and traditional way of thinking but the same leaving Rome at the time was incredibly ruthless and completely you know detached well, they could be mimicking like the wealth of the Greeks but they still considered them as a degenerated race and when it took to raise Corinth and Carthage to the ground they they did it right and just it was actually a very pragmatic and concrete choice because it was a reason on, on the base of you know what was happening in the various provinces like doing this would show the world that Rome was not kidding they still got it and it was actually the case but of course the internal uh, system of Rome was sort of a, quite of a like in quite changing at the roots and so what uh, the Imperium was held by later was through a system that was definitely uh, on the move in many ways was was being altered from the within and uh, and I think Cato represents one of the most important steps in this like if, uh, as a figure uh, biographically like if you consider the time uh, the place the the general temper like that's what you uh, what you major this guy in love with the with the ancestral Italic countryside and uh, way of life uh, of the rough uh, say Latin shepherds and eventually agricultures well that that's the the model that this guy w was looking at right it, there couldn't be at a deeper level a uh, moral rejuvenation if that sense of hard work or accomplishment of actual practical move actualization of the self through uh, the increased power of this activity that had fostered in fact those the, the same romans that had conquered the Mediterranean at this point through that earth, through that blood, um, could have not, like, in fact, brought closer to God, right? Without and this is a bit uh, the idea. Then, of course, on these topics, we can make three thousand videos, and I hope that we will stick to to this sort of um, timeline and feeling. But it's incredibly important to appreciate even just step by step single perspectives and how uh, these people did it because it's um, it's only understanding their context uh, and their individuality at the same time that you can fully uh, appreciate the, their historical relevance All right and this is definitely not the last video on Kato that we make for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.